Merry Christmas. Can you believe that when you're kids, Christmas can't get here soon enough, right? Every day moves like molasses. We have, what, 11 days? As adults, it just flies by. It's amazing. Well, we're on the home stretch for Mr. Billy Chittister and family arriving, so I don't want to pass up another opportunity to pray for him, so uh, we'll do that here in just a second. But remember, we're praying for healthy transitions, a uh, home, finding a home, uh, the kids settling in, incorporating into this new culture, new environment, and finding friends, and, and really plugging in and just uh, in a fresh way. So we want to pray for them. Uh, a lot of, lot of new for them, and it's a new year, so everything kind of, it's kind of like a perfect storm, if you will. So we want to be sure to pray for them this morning. So I'd ask, if you would, would you stand with me, and let's pray for Billy and his family. Uh, as we look forward to the transition here in a couple weeks. Father, we're grateful for today. We're thankful for your loving kindness. We have celebrated you already. We've heard through song that you, Father, are the master, the redeemer, the savior of the world. You sent your son for us that we might live and have life, and we are so grateful that we could uh, join with brothers and sisters today to celebrate you in song and then hear your word and then participate in the Lord's Supper today, Father. So we're grateful for the time uh, as a family. Father, we are so excited. Billy is coming in just a few weeks now. We are so excited for his arrival. Uh, As with everything new, there are changes. There's changes in time and space and uh, energy and enthusiasm. There's changes in people and and, uh, touches. And I just pray, Father, that you would give his family, just the exact measure of grace that they're going to need during this move. The logistical things that still are weighing on their hearts and their minds, Father, I'm grateful that you have those already planned out. I'm grateful that these people I know are faithfully praying that his transition to Elmdale would be a smooth one. I pray, Father, that when he gets here, he finds our hearts ready. He finds a church humble and ready to move and to be used by you. I pray that your name would be great because of his time here. I pray that you would be exalted because the rallying of the people. I pray that your deeds would be known among the people of this community, um, Father, and that, that, that we would be a light and resonate hope and love for everyone around. Father, we thank you for the way you've provided once again in your incredible way and look forward to Billy's arrival. So uh, be with him today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. All right, so Christmas season is a great time to remember. Uh, So just a quick question. What are the details of the first or second or third Christmas that you remember? What are they? So I want you to take one minute and turn to somebody around you and share that. Go, it should be noisy. This is weird, but do it. Go. First Christmas memory, quick. Thirty seconds. Okay. All right, so cut it off. Some of you were still going because the sights and sounds were so vivid, right? For most people, Christmas has some very positive memories. For kids, it's all about the anticipation of the one coming. You know, this one, tomorrow, 14 days from now, great, or however many days, 11 days from now. That's the anticipation. For those of us who are older in years, it's about the nostalgia about Christmas past. We remember the connections of family and friends and the warmth. And for, for many, it's not necessarily just the gifts, But it's the time and the occasion. I can still remember our stockings. I still don't know what they meant with the walnuts and the the nuts that I didn't even know what they were that were packed into our stocking. What was that all about? I have no idea, but I can remember it, right? And so you think about that. This is a great time of the year for us to remember a past what Christmas was and future what Christmas will be. And we do that well. 
I think as Christians, we celebrate two holidays really, really well, Christmas and Easter. Our attendance proves it. We have more people attend church at Christmas and Easter than any other time of the year. The secular world calls them seeing ears. That's the only time some people come to church. But I think because of all the hype and bustle and the, the media of today, sometimes we forget what the season is all about. Yes, it is about the birth of Christ. And we think about that, but really, it's about the hope for all mankind. Christ's birth ushers in that hope. If so, it's no wonder we sing joy to the world at Christmas. Why not? It's the only joy. Today, we're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper. We do that a lot at Christmas. We do that, obviously, we do that at Easter. But what does that mean, and how does that fit in the context of Christmas? Listen to this. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So think about where that fits in the book of 1 Corinthians. Right in the middle of all these significant, heavy theological discussions that the church is arguing about. They're having fights, basically, about the gifts, about tongues, about love. Right in the middle of all that, Paul says, don't forget what Christ told us to do to remember him. He says, let me pass on to you what I know to be true. And he instructs his followers, those of us who are Christ followers, to do this drink, have this meal in remembrance of him. And so, yes, we do remember Christ on his birth, and we remember uh, at Easter Christ and his death and his resurrection, and we should do both. But listen to what he says. He says, anytime you have this meal together, do it together and remember me. Now, they were in the upper room, right? This was as Jesus had come into Jerusalem. He's with his disciples, and it's predicated on his eventual arrest, crucifixion. So he, he's having the traditional Passover meal that's very well known for all the Jewish people of that day. It was one of three big celebrations slash meals that they participated in every year. And the Passover is the meal where they were intent on reliving, and get this, remembering what God had done for them and the events of Exodus out of Egypt on their way and journey to freedom. It was a significant event and celebration. It's a feast, but with very specific rules. When this happened originally back in Exodus, if you'll read that passage, what you'll find is Jesus told them to be dressed and ready to go, eat unleavened bread, eat the most uh, spot-free, unblemished lamb you could find, and take the blood of that lamb and spread it over the doorposts. So this was the night, this was, the, this was a specific meal. And so from that point forward, this was a celebration remembering what God had done. But sitting at this table, Jesus changes everything. He changes the meaning of the Passover meal. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen is about to be stoned. And he recalls specific history of the children of Israel. He basically reminds those that are about to stone him what God had done through Abraham, Isaac, Joseph, and Moses. And that's a lot of what would happen in the historical way of the Passover meal for the Israelites. They would think about their history. And then they would move to the point where Moses led them out of Egypt. The Passover, God instructed them to, to be dressed, ready to leave, eat this lamb, and then put the blood on the doorframe because what happened he had done these plagues for the Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh hardened his heart and wouldn't let the people go. But this was the last plague. You put this blood on your doorpost because here's what's going to happen. The angel of death is going to pass through the, through the town, through all the towns. 
and the firstborn is going to be killed. Anyone who does not have this blood over the doorpost will be killed. And this is the final straw for Pharaoh. As after this happens, even though he had endured all the other plagues, he let the children of Israel go. And as they were going, God provided for the children every day manna, a bread-like substance for heaven, so that they could just pick it up off the ground and eat it. He provided for all their needs in the desert 2,000 years ago. He provided for all of our needs. He did for us what he did for the children of Israel. Yeah, he was born in a humble manger, right? He lived and met us here. He walked or sawed. But then on the night he was betrayed at this Passover meal, he changed it. Remember, his blood shed for you and I. He delivered the people. They would remember that he delivered them from incredible slavery at the hands of the Egyptian. He delivers us from the bondage and penalty of death. He removes our feet. The Bible says he removes our feet from the miry clay and sets them on a rock. The purchase, the fountain of blood from Emmanuel's veins liberates us and provides hope for you, for me, and for all mankind. Emmanuel, God with us. He asks us that as often as we drink from the cup, that we do so in remembrance of him and what remembering that it's his blood that washes us white as snow. As the lamb was important for the Egyptians, you know, they, they ate the lamb and then they put the blood over the doorpost. It was so important in the role of the exodus from their uh, slavery and bondage to the Egyptians. But it's important to us as well. John, in John chapter 1, John the Baptist, when he sees Jesus coming, what does he say? He says, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. We remember, and we should remember. Jesus shows them the bread, and he says, and get this, did you know that Bethlehem literally means house of bread? So Jesus was born in the house of bread. And we're told in scriptures that he's the bread of life. John says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He, he, he breathed our air, walked our saw. The manna from heaven for the Egyptians is now the birth of Christ for me and you. as the bread of life. He provided for the Israelites and God provided for us just what we needed at just the right time. Listen to Isaiah 53 as it predicts the coming of Christ. Surely he took upon our pain and our, bore our suffering, yet, we're, we, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shears is silent, he did not open his mouth. Remember. Remember. We are celebrating the birth of Jesus, but he wants us to remember the totality of what that birth did for us. We remember that Jesus was born a baby, but how often do we forget what he endured for me and you. Isaiah 53 just told us. He endured the shedding of blood, the giving of his own life. Now in just a few minutes, we're going to be passing out the elements. And Paul tells us that that is a serious manner. And that we do so by examining our hearts in a serious way and taking them with confession on our mouth and in our heart, asking the Holy Spirit to cleanse us and make us ready to celebrate, to remember the blood shed by the blood of the Lamb that takes away the sins of the world, to remember the, the, the bread of life that Jesus is for us. Now, for those of you who do not know Jesus, you have never received salvation and the life that his death offers, we invite you to watch this solemn yet celebratory occasion, event. You can know him, and to do so, you have to publicly acknowledge him and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, and then you too can be saved. But for those of us who are Christ followers, this is a great moment. We get to celebrate and remember what Christ has done. 
Now, I love my, probably my favorite Christmas um, music is Chris Rice's Welcome to Our World. I want to read the last three uh, verses for you as we remember. He says, bring your peace into our violence. Bid our hungry souls be filled. Word now breaking, heaven silence. Welcome to our world. Fragile finger sent to heal us. Tender brow prepared for thorn. Tiny heart whose blood will save us. Unto us is born. So wrap our injured flesh around you. Breathe our air and walk our sod. Rob our sin and make us holy. Perfect son of God. Welcome to our world. God just did just that. He sent his son to rob our sin and make us holy. He lived, he died, he rose again. And we have a chance to remember that today. Let's pray as Jeff comes and leads us in the Lord's Supper. Father, we're grateful for this morning.